Okay. Uh, so the switch statement is another. I don't think that one exists in Python. So it's just another way of, of creating an if else if. However, we do not use uh, Boolean logic on this one. Uh, let me write the syntax here. So uh, switch and then a variable that will evaluate to an integer. Open close curly brace. So this uh, has to be of integer type, right? Some variable. And uh, we say case one. And then we write some code. And when we are done with this code block, we say a keyword break semicolon. So if there's one to n lines, one to n lines will be executed. And then when the break statement hits, the code will jump to whatever statements down here. So uh, we can also say case two and then some code, and then break. And to handle any other situation that are not one and two, or um, simply like else, then we use the keyword uh, default. And then we write some code there. From here, it'll jump to over here. And that's the syntax for... Yeah, it's it's similar to, to the if-else if. We just have to keep in mind that this right here does not use a Boolean expression. Instead, it uses a uh, an integer. So... And we'll, we'll work out an example. Something that evaluates to an integer. So it's usually an integer type or a char. And uh, some students at times want to get creative, be my guest, but usually like we want to stick to what works for the language and something that evaluates to an integer will, will work for us, right? Let me open code. Uh, I think I closed this one. This is for the other class. And then we open this one. Uh, let's see if I have any changes. I think I have all the changes. I didn't commit them, so let me do that right now. So I did grade the assignments. So before you type any examples or if you, before you do any new homework or whatever, it's always good to come to the version control icon or source control icon. Click on the three dots and do pull. If you're on the online compiler, then when you open the replit, somewhere in this area of the screen, you'll see an orange uh, labeled button. You click on that one and it'll get the changes to your, if there's any changes, right, to your replit. So it's always good to open. The first thing you want to do always is do a pull. That way you get the latest changes into your local machine. Okay, so let me, I guess I'll check all of this in. And I think it was if, if, else, if. So I'll commit them. And then I'll push them. And while it's doing that, let me get a tab down here. And I want to go to the GitHub and just show you a little tidbit. So notice my changes here, if uh, the one I just made. If I click on this uh, link, then it'll show me the changes. It'll show me the file that I modified as it was before. And then on the right side, it'll show me as it is now. 
if you don't have this view then you may have the unified view so it may look like this I personally prefer the split view because it shows me what I had on the left and now what I have on the right so uh, that's how you can see what changes you made and if you want to see what changes I made usually in the grading I put a link for you so if you post that link in the browser then it'll take you to a page like I just showed you so you could see what you had and what I uh, corrected also on the right side below the code button right here you see uh, commits X number of commits right yours may be different than mine if you click on it it'll show you a history of changes to to the repository so I've made some changes as you can see uh, since we started the class right so add professor example homework grading I disable some compilation right so it's always good to put meaningful con comments in the work that you're doing because it'll help you uh, if uh, you want to go back and see for example what you did and then you, you labeled it like classwork one or homework one and then wh what that homework was about then you're keeping a breadcrumb of all you've done in this class and also one other thing if uh, if you click on the less than greater than sign right here it'll say browse the repository at this point in the history so you will see all the changes up to this point you will not see these changes and these changes so that's sometimes developers when they're researching bugs that's what they'll do they'll come and they just want to see the changes up to a certain point and they can come to the browser and, and, and investigate issues right so okay so let me go to Explorer and we are in the switch and we'll go here and we need to write a function that accepts a number and returns a string right so more than likely an integer we already have the include over here so we can say uh, start string right our function returns a string and we'll name it menu then in this example I don't have a name but I know we're creating some menu example here uh, we have one parameter integer I think uh, option and uh, we copy everything but the semicolon and then we can go to switch.cpp and we have some requirements here um, paste open close curly brace switch.h that's already included and I know I stated it already but when you include a header any includes the header has are implicitly included for us so here are strings available for us so that's why this string works right we gave it the namespace and we know that for a string to function in a program we need the namespace and the include but the includes already in the switch.h file okay so write code for function so if the value for option is one we want to return the string option one all the way to four right and if it's anything other than one two three or four we want to return invalid option so we can uh, create a string and before we forget we say return return underscore value and uh, okay so we set up our statement switch and we can say option which option this option that's coming into our function okay and then we can say uh, one let me remove these comments to make it clear so notice that uh, we have case one meaning if option is one 
then execute some code here. Oh, I was kind enough to do the whole snippet for us. That's nice. Okay, so we will say uh, if it's case one, then we want return value to be option one. And if it's number two, we want to set the value to option two. And then we want to break. And I'll stop here and then we'll go to the test case and start writing our test case to validate this function. So the test case will be in test examples uh, 03 module 03 module test CPP. We well, I've typed some examples already, right? So let me write another test case here. So test switch menu function and uh, in the homework if I'm asking you to write a test case with assertions then each required statement is an assertion okay like we, we are asserting that this is the case right so we want to create an assertion require and if we call menu which our test case has no clue of because we need to include switch and once we do that then menu is live for us so it takes some number and I've had students ask me about functions in the office hour um, how or who's going to provide the value for option and it depends, right? If you're writing the test case, then you provide the value without using the CEN object, the character in. We know that we can type a number here. So we are creating the function. We know that if we send the function uh, parameter argument one, we should expect this function to return option one back to us. So we're testing that. So in test cases, do not use CN. If you use CN, your test case will eventually time out because the test case runs in the background, meaning like we don't have access to key anything in. So if you type CN in uh, CN statement in here, it'll be waiting for a human to type something. But since we don't have access to the program while it's running, it'll eventually time out. So, so we write a literal instead here and in main we usually capture data from the keyboard stuff it in a variable and then use the variable into our function and we'll see that when we create the example in the main for menu okay so I know we coded this piece and then we coded option 2 and then while the snippet also included the default break for us, which we know should work as an else statement. Meaning, if I use something other than one, two, three, or four, then I should receive back the string invalid option. Here I will use menu zero, and over here I will use menu five. So I have four assertions in my test case to test uh, the code that I've written so far, this piece of code right here. So I can go to my CMake, go to the test case, uh, examples test, module three, right click, run in terminal. And it'll build our example. Again, usually, like if you're learning how to program and they don't introduce the concept of testing or unit testing to you, you would write the function and then you would go to the main program, whether it be Python, Java, C Sharp, or whatever, and you just call the function with 
different values and then verify the output visually. Uh, with test cases, as you can see, we are creating a test bank. See, like we're creating a test bank of uh, test cases and assertions for our code. So as we change our program, then, uh, oh, I know why it failed. As we change our program, we have the confidence that if we do something wrong, the test case is going to slap our hand and, and let us know, hey, you did something wrong. Right? So we go to switch, and the default is there, but we didn't write any code here. Right? So here we need to say that if it's not one or two, in this case for the cases, then we need to return invalid option. We set return value to invalid option, and then we return uh, the return value. Now we can run our test case again, and it should be green. So, as you can see, we have five test cases, 16 assertions, so we're creating a bank of test cases. And that's like a protective harness uh, for our programs. Okay, so yesterday a student asked me, and usually someone asks me, like, do we need this statement, the break statement? Like, do we need it? Like, and the way we've structured the code here, yes, we need it. If we do not include the break statement, what do you all think is going to happen? It'll go through all the cases until it finds a break. Yes, right? So it'll go to case one, case two, case two has a break uh, statement so it'll break out but you're you're correct like it'll like even though like we type one here it'll come here we don't have a break statement and then it'll just go here that's just the way this statement or this structure works and we can verify this by rerunning the test case again so we right click and we run And we wait. So notice that it's also kind enough. I think I've said this before, but I'll still say it again. Something failed. So option two equals option one, even though we say if we use one, we are expecting option one back. But since we removed the break statement from line 19, then it just jumps to the next case and sets return value to option two. It breaks and then it returns the value. So that's why it, the value is option two. And here it's kind enough to tell us check your test case line 37, uh, which is this one. So there's something wrong <clears throat> with the function parameter one. So we can come here and we can be, whoa, whoa, whoa. oh yeah, I forgot the break, right? We have forgotten. There are times when you want to eliminate the breaks. Like for example, if you want to do something, if the, the value is uh, one, two, or three, then you can eliminate the breaks for case one and two. And sometimes programmers do that, right? In that case, I usually say, well, just use they fail safe, right? But I've known, I've noticed that like legacy C++ programmers, they love the switch, the switch uh, statement. So. We can go ahead and finish writing case one through case four. I'll just kind of copy and paste here, change this, change this, and change this. So now I can go to my test case and add two more assertions with uh, function param parameter arguments three and four. So I come here and I can say, okay, let me add two more assertions. So I'll call menu with value 
3 and then value 4 and I'm expecting option 3 and option 4 and with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 assertions we've tested all the edge cases for our program so we can not a program or function right so then we can do running terminal and we should see green also while, it, while we're waiting when uh, you have test cases and an, a defect or a bug reported usually what the developer will do is he will add another assertion and uh, they'll get the values that cost the issue usually those values are stored in a, in a uh, output log so the developer uh, goes to the output log and gets the values that produce the error and then he uses those values in the test case to create an assertion and then he runs a test case and the test case should fail and when it fails then the developer can go and investigate what happened fix the code run the test case again and then that new assertion should pass as should all the old assertions that are there if the old ones fail and the new one passes that means that the change he made broke something so then he has to go back and make sure that uh, whatever he broke uh, he recodes it to make sure that that feature or those features are not broken so it's not extra work uh, to create test cases it's actually a very useful and it's a very useful skill to know so as we can see here, uh, assertions passed, and we can do up arrow space dash s enter, or maybe not there. I have to click here. Up arrow. Mm -hmm. oh, maybe not there either. Let me get this guy out of the way. Space dash s enter. So now I have five test cases in this test uh, CPP. 18 assertions, all of them are green, and that's that's what we want like as we're growing our code base we're growing our test cases and then we are confident that the code we're producing works as expected we can go to main program now and again I, I say like if you're working in a team usually this is a workflow you, you go through you write some code you test that code with test cases once it's working then you can integrate your code into the main program and uh, the main program may be like a Android application, C Sharp, Java, whatever, right? But other developers will be confident that it's working because they see your test case is passing and, and that's always a good thing. So here we're doing it at a smaller scale. We go into the main and the main usually is just an example. So we go to main and we need to include a switch here and uh, okay so uh, we can have some number option and uh, I did create the assignment some students they just write the sin statement and then like option I mean, the program works I mean it works like it'll run but if you're distributing that program to users they're uh, they're not gonna know like I mean, I mean the cursor is blinking there and they're kind of like what so always like prompt the user or help give them hints right like what are they what do you want them to do that way they, they know what's going on so I didn't take any points off right but next time I will so please make sure that you prompt users with output text okay okay so then we want to uh, we return string right so string result we are going to call the menu function and we will use the variable option as a function parameter argument and then finally we'll simply 
display display it like this. I mean, that's I mean a very simple program, right? So we're always uh, capturing, uh, prompting user, capture input, save it into the option variable. Now this will have some value when this statement executes. Create a variable a string result in main type always int int main type always int like, uh, like this guy. Yes, that's that's a requirement for C plus uh, plus. Okay, so then we call menu and then we can use option variable with some value and then we'll capture the result and then we'll display the result so we come to cmake and we want to execute the examples we go to module 3 we go to switch right click run in terminal enter a number so we will enter 0 so invalid option we run the program again by hitting up arrow since we don't have a loop right to run it again or to keep executing so then we enter one so option one is displayed and then we hit up arrow again to run it again we type the number five invalid option up arrow enter some negative number right invalid option so now our function works any questions Okay, no questions. So, so that was the switch statement. And again, let, let me review, right? So, so the syntax, this guy has to evaluate to an integer. And some developers use characters because characters eventually evaluate to integers. And that's okay. So, uh, that'll work fine my advice is we'll stick to integers right if, if that's what it's supposed to do then then do that anything else use the if else if also don't make a case switch statement that has like 20 cases if that's the case then then you need to break down your program further right like we don't want a fun, uh, switch statement that's like 20 up 20 cases long Usually, if that happens, then we need to break down that code into smaller uh, code blocks. So I would say, like, at the most, four to five should be okay. Anything else than that, you need to rethink or re redesign your program. Okay. So there was no question. So then that means we can move on to the immediate if so I think this is pretty small Let's see uh, can I uh, change the font here uh, bold it well, that's maybe font size 16. Uh, probably too small still. Okay, so that should be visible. So we have a, a Boolean expression on the far left side, right here. Assuming that X, Y, and Z have been declared, right? So X less than zero, that's the Boolean expression. So if X is less than zero, execute Y equals to 10, else set z equals 20 and this is a perfect shortcut for using the if else statement and you can use it like i've seen it used in graphics applications when 
they want to set values to a text box or a pop-up box or a pop-up a syntax helper. I mean, a pop-up helper. I mean, developers, I get it. I guess, you know, they, they write code every day. Eventually, they're like, ah, let me use this shortcut. So it, it's good to know because if you run into it, then you can understand what the developer was doing because I'm pretty sure that a developer who uses it is not going to put there, this is a shortcut if they're just going to type that code. Okay, so we can go to main. Questions here? Okay, no questions. So let's go to the same main that we're working on right now. Uh, this one. Okay, so what do we do here? So we have option. And I guess we can say uh, y equals 0, z equals 0. So we create uh, two variables and assign the value 0 to them. And then here we will use this in the Boolean expression, the option value. So we'll say if uh, option greater than 5, set y equals 10, l set z equals to 20. We create a new line here. And then we say C out. Uh, we'll just see them out uh, Y next to each other. Y, and then we will display C, Z on one line, right? So at any one time when we run this program, one of them is going to be zero and the other one's going to have some value, okay? Depending on, on the condition or the, the number option, right? So let's see here. We come here and then we run it. So enter number one. So the number is one. So is one greater than five? No. So then it doesn't do this. It does the else part. So then it says z equals 20. And that's why down here, z is 20. If we execute the program again, so up arrow, enter, and then we type the number four. Uh, well, actually I meant to do six, right? So six, so now six is greater than five. So it executes the if part first and does not do this else in this instance. So then it sets y equals 10 and z, as you can see, still has the value zero and y is now 10. So that's a shortcut if I mean, free to use it in your programs, you know, just make sure you understand how it works, right? So this guy right here has to be a uh, Boolean expression, meaning it has to evaluate to true or false. And then you can use this uh, syntax to create your if else structure. Questions? Yeah, this class knows everything. Okay, so what's the meaning of question mark? Yeah, that they and that, that question was asked yesterday too, right? So that's the symbol they use to let the compiler know that if there's a Boolean expression, what this uh, immediate if, right? So this this guy right here is known as an immediate if immediate if or uh, shortcut if. The question mark is probably a symbol that was free for them to use to tell the compiler if you see a boolean expression on the left side and then there's a question mark and then there's something some valid statement here 
and then a colon, and then on the right side of the colon, some other expression, then it's an immediate if, right? So usually that's, but always make, be mindful. Well, I guess in this case it doesn't want it. Okay. Irvin, is that good enough? It's just a symbol they, they use to, oh, they can get as complicated as you want them to be, right? Like the Boolean expressions, you can use ands or ors to make them more complicated, but I, I was just interested in showing you the basic usage for it. Could I have a second check for the if? I'm pretty sure you can have a second check, but in that case, just use an nested if else, right? Because then the code's going to be hard to read and understand. Even for you, like, you might know right now what you did, and then later you're like, what? So remember, either you or someone else is going to be maintaining the code, so always remember that. Any other questions? I'm pretty sure that'll that'll work because we're executing a statement. But usually you would want to go with an if else, like if that was the case, because it, it's easier to read in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like Remember, you're writing the code, and yeah, you can get creative, but at some point, you may have to go back and maintain it, and so you want to write clean code, right? Because usually when you write code now, and then six months from now, you have to come back and revisit it, and then you're like, what? <laughs> what did I do here? So, Or even worse, like somebody else wrote the code, and then you have to go and maintain it is kind of like oh what what is this guy doing what and then usually that person doesn't work there anymore or uh, there were a contractor that was brought in to help or whatever and then he's gone to some other work and yeah so okay so boolean expressions let me see can we cover that yeah so if you know uh, if you took notes for the for the and a truth table the or truth table and the not truth table then you you can use those to help you create uh, boolean expressions right because sometimes you might either want to cover a range for example here we want to say like let's do something on line 17 Let's do something if uh, the value is not 1 through, what was it, 4? 1 through 4. Let's do something. So how can we do that, like right here, like if we want to... instead of option greater than five. So we have we would have to use uh, a Boolean logic operator and then we would have to maybe say like option greater than or equal to something and then something something, right? I know what it is, but I mean, usually, like, if students chime in, then we can learn from each other. Not option. Yeah, not option. So greater than five, not option, but we're still not covering a range, right? Because because then any negative number will work. Yeah.
Yeah, so we can, so yeah, the, the chat command, we can do that, right? So option, option less than five and option greater than zero will work. Uh, so what if we want to, without using an and, okay? What if we want to do something if the values are not one, one through four? Yeah, so if we want, so we, we, so Julia gives a correct statement for doing something if the values one through four, including one and four, right? But what if, without using the and operator, what if we want to do something if values are not one, two, three, or four? It's okay to give an answer and be half right or not right or whatever. Like, I'm sure, like another student will use the default. No, no, like we're we're not we're not using the the switch, right? We're talking about creating a Boolean expression like this uh, to do something if the value is not one, two, three, or four. So if so, option less than one, and how how do we format the other the other half? Yeah, the state Felicia like that statement. Remember the 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 end. The way it works is like if one is false, both it's false, right? So, yeah. So yeah. So Julia's correct, right? So, so if option less than one or option greater than four, then option greater than or equal five or option less than one. Yeah. So up to four, but Adrian, yeah, that's more or less a correct statement, right? So, point being is like you can use the logic. Uh, Boolean logic operators to help uh, solve number range problems or later range problems or what have you, as long as you understand the truth tables for them, right? So, so the statement option greater or equal five and option less than one. So that one we have to remember that that the and operator, if one is false, then both are then the statement's false. So that that statement will never evaluate to true because one number cannot be uh, greater than or equal to five and less than equal zero at the same time. So that's that's why that one will never. And in the end, both of them have to be true for the expression to be true. So okay, so make sure you understand the truth tables because they'll they'll help you. Like not only in this class but in the future like to create uh, and work with those, the Boolean expressions. Okay, so we go to uh, the while loop and that'll be our last example. And I think I have to go come in here and first of all, let me check in this code. So uh, stage all changes and switch and immediate if examples commit uh, 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 save uh, let me see make uh, did I change something here to mess it up well I don't think I want this one or this one okay so 
Okay. Yeah, he didn't do my main. Let me get that in there too. And then I'll go ahead and push it. So that should be <clears throat> in my repository. In my repository, you all can access it. You just have to go here. So if you're on your home page, click on the left side link right here. And then just do a search for my name. And then you can click on it and then you can go in and either click on commit so you can if you're looking for a certain example then you can go and find that example and you're welcome to go look at it okay so we need to come here examples C make list so SRC example C make list and open module 4 so for now if you were like muting previous work or examples for this one don't do it because module module 4 has some dependencies on module 3 so so just open module 4 for compiling and then we go to examples test see make list and we'll do the same thing we will open module 4 okay and then we come back to OneNote and we have the while loop and the structure for the while loop the syntax for the while loop while some uh, boolean expression and somewhere here we have to change or do something, execute something to change the boolean expression and that's to finalize the loop. So, so it's a pre-check loop meaning it can execute zero times because it, the boolean expression might evaluate to false or it, it, zero or more times, right? So uh, to avoid infinite loops Always remember that somewhere in your code block, something has to be happening to change the Boolean expression uh, to false to make sure that we uh, stop executing the loop. Okay, so usually the books give you examples for main. Let me see here. Where am I? Module 4, while loop. And we can do that. So include IOStream using stud out using stud cn, and we will create a char choice, set it to lowercase y, and we will say while choice equals y or choice equals uppercase y then loop again in here we will ask the user uh, enter y to continue any other character to exit right, whatever okay and then we say character in choice so as long as the user types lowercase y or uppercase y this loop will continue prompting them whether they want to continue or not so let's run this piece of code and we cannot test this code with a test case okay because well it's not a function so we come here what would we need to use a to upper function yeah we can use that but I've not covered that so so then we use what we've learned so far which is uh, boolean logic exp uh, operators okay so notice that module 4 is not here if that's the case click on this icon so make sure you click on cmake first to get this uh, <coughs> view 
clear window and then come up here and hit configure all projects and now module 4 is there file run in terminal enter y to continue okay uppercase y x right so program exit so what is happening we enter y lowercase y so choice equals y true or choice equals y false but the expression would evaluate to true because with ors if one evaluates to true then then it's true and then we prompt the user to enter y to continue right so if they do y lowercase or y uppercase this program will continue looping once i entered x then it came in here and choice uh, is not equal to x and choice is not equal to y so then uh, that turned this expression into false and then my program exited okay questions on this example Okay, so we will come into the while.h. So examples, 04 module, 01 while, while.h. And we want to create a function that returns an int sum of squares, accepts an int number. And we come into the header and we will write the code for sum of squares. So we come here to while.cpp and this is where you all will help me write the code and the test cases will verify that our code's correct so it's saying here that if we get a number then we want to get the sum of the number from one to the number right we i mean not the sum we get the sum of the square so we square the number and either add one or subtract subtract one so if we start from one then we go up to the number and if we decide to start from the number then we go all the way back to to one so can somebody help me write this logic right here we want to produce like one times one plus two times two plus three times three plus four times four and it has to work for any number not just for number four okay you just click configure all files and that's it it'll it'll display the new uh, module for you um, seven uh, we have what seven minutes right or 17 minutes so if we can do it in 17 minutes I'm pretty sure we can but I'll wait for you all to help me So again, if we have the number four, then we want to square four and have a sum variable and then subtract one from num and then that'll give us three. Then we want to square that and add it to sum and then subtract one from num and square that number and add it to sum and then finally subtract one more, square that and then add it to the number. So how do we do that with code? So I'll get you all started. We need a while loop. And we need to return something. So I will wait for you all to guide me here. No. We're using while loops. I know you all wrote loops in Python, right? So while num not equal zero, okay. While num not equal zero, okay. And then what else? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, we, we have to use an accumulator. So how do I how do I do that? Well, maybe 17 minutes is not enough time. So I'll wait. Create a sum variable, set num equal 5 above the while. So we, we can't change the num. So we'll, uh, so we'll go with create a sum variable. Okay, so create a sum variable. Okay, so I'll create a sum variable. Sum. So if we create sum, what are we returning here? Sum. Okay. Okay, so num times num equals sum. Like this? Maybe not. Are you all watching TV or something? Shouldn't the num in the follow be less than sum and start from one in the function? Well, here uh, I'm assuming the students are going to count backwards because they say like num not equals zero. So I'm assuming they're going to, and I think from what I saw here, num minus one equals num. So that was Richard's comment. So, I'm, so that's on the right path. So, how do we accumulate something? Y'all did it in Python. Sum plus equals num times num, okay. And then num, oh, very good, right? So you can use this one, right? Usually students are like, well, we do num equals num minus one, but we can also use the unary operator in C++ to deduct one each time the loop executes. So with this code, we just have to make sure that we tell our users that the number has to be positive. Uh, no, my, yeah, you can also do that one, num minus equals one, yeah. Okay, so now we can write a test case. So we come here, module four, zero four module test, and we can write the test case. Test uh, sum of squares uh, function. So we create one assertion with require. We need to include while up here. And sum of squares is there for us. And according to the requirements, if we use four, that should yield a value of 30. So we can click on CMake and go test case, examples test, 04 modules test, EX04 test, right click, run in terminal. 
and it's compiling and let's see what happens. So it's still so what we'll do is once we get this squared away then we'll do the other way right we'll uh, we'll start at one and go up to the number so that we can see how to do it the both both ways oh, linking taking a sweet time so we got like some weird number uh, two so what happened? So let's go back and look at our code, right? So prime example of how test cases can help us. So what happened here? Maybe something wrong with a compiler. Let's try it one more time. Uh, compilers, right? So, so what's going on here? Anyone? Is this is this correct? This statement right here and this statement right here, are they correct? Yeah, some number eight, so eight, right? So it, it is an integer, some is an integer, statement eight. But you're onto something there, Hilario. There's something wrong we forgot here. I mean, we, we should always do as best practices. Num is defined right here, it's a function parameter set value to zero right so if we do not set value to zero then we get errors like this so we should be able to run Up arrow space dashes enter it likes us now hmm? so we know four works but what about other numbers so let's come here so again remember when you're going to use an accumulator or a, a sum variable then make sure you initialize it to some value otherwise whatever values uh, in memory when the uh, compiler gets that memory address that's whatever value it's going to use and that's where we get all kinds of weird answers okay so so what if we use the number three here and the number five here so if we use three here and then we use here let me see okay so this should be 55 this should be 14 14 right so now we added three assertions to make sure that, well, I mean, it works for four, but does it work for other numbers? Running terminal. And it's thinking. Linking, finally. So, looks good. Up arrow space dash s enter. So our sum of squares function looks good, right? So 
Okay, what if uh, we want to take a different approach? We want to uh, use the, uh, we'll say this one is number two, right? So, what if we want to not start at the number, we want to start at zero or one and then work our way up to the number? How, how do we code that one to produce the same result? So we know we need a, we need a sum and we will initialize it and we need to return it and we know we need a while loop and then uh, we need some code so we have four minutes to square this one out so now we, we if we get four then we want to start like one times one plus two times two plus three times three plus four times four well, that's what we want to do So what kind of expression do I put here? Yes, we so we want so we did what we did here is we counted from 4 all the way to 0. Now we want to do the opposite. Like if it's 4, we want to start at 1 and work our way up to 4. So how do we code that but produce the same result, right? Like 1 times 1 plus 2 times 2 plus 3 times 3 plus 4 times 4 equals some number. Less than three minutes, create a counter variable. Very good. So, and make sure we initialize it, right? So, uh, okay, so while in the condition, while counter. less than num okay and then in here we can just look at the code right it'll be more or less the same so sum plus equals num or counter which one do we use here count right so count times count and then next statement num plus plus uh, and it'll be count plus plus so it'll be count plus plus right because we want to work ourselves from zero to the value of the num okay so let's let's write the test case right so this should be f easy what I'll do is I'll just copy and make this uh, did I say underscore two or two underscore two okay underscore two underscore two underscore two and this text right here can never be the same text as another test case so they have to be differentiated by at least one character so then we'll say test sum of squares function two. If you have the same name, the test cases will not run. So please remember that. Okay, run in terminal. And it's thinking there is a class assignment today, so don't scamper out of here. Should be easy. And linking, taking his time. Oh, it failed, right? So we can fix it quickly. And so we're saying well, count less than num. So, so uh, is 4 less than 4? Yeah, it has to be less than equal. 
I, I knew that was going to fail, but I purposely did it so you can see how the test cases can uh, let you know right away that something's wrong. So usually uh, when you're learning how to code, you write the, the function and then you go in main and type in some different numbers. But as you can see here with the test cases, it's a lot easier because now we tested two functions just by hitting run again, right? So up arrow space dash s enter, and now our code works. So that was the while loop. So there is a, a short assignment. It is, uh, let me stop recording here. You just have to create the truth tables for, and uh, it should be there in the calendar. And, uh, or, and not. And you can, uh, type them in Word, copy and paste them into the comment section of uh, the assignment and then submit the assignment.